Thank you very much for joining this webinar, a preview into KSIM 3.0. My name is Wilmer Compagnoni, and I am one of the primary developers behind KSIM and KSIM 3.0. And before we get started getting into the agenda of our webinar today, I want to remind everybody that the reason uh, it's all very quiet here and we're all muted is that's in an effort to keep the background noise to a minimum. So everybody upon entry into this webinar is muted. And uh, that's, again, to try to keep the background noise minimum and have the optimal conditions for everybody. If you do have a question, uh, please submit them through the Q&A uh, the Q &A window of the Zoom session. And um, we will address those as soon as I'm done with my slides and, and my demo. If you have any further questions, um, you, you can, I'll give an email address to which you can submit those questions and we'll get to them at that point. We're also uh, recording this webinar so that uh, anybody that could not actually make it to the live session will be able to attend or will be able to view it at a later time. So with that, um, I'll get this started. So um, some of you on the call may be familiar with KSIM and our KSIM set of tools. And uh, the current iteration of KSIM, as we call it KSIM 2.0, was launched about five years ago or so. And with some minor changes and additions here or there, it's largely remained unchanged for the last five years. And KSIM 3.0 is uh, a big change from what some of you may already be used to in KSIM. And hopefully that will be received as improvements. We still maintain some of the original things that made KSIM 2.0 successful. And we added more features that we've been dying to add for some time now. So um, let's get a little bit into the agenda for what today is gonna be like and what we're gonna cover. So, um, we'll go into a brief history of KSIM and uh, chemical simulation tools in general. Then um, we'll talk a little bit about what KSIM 2.0 was and looks like and what some of those shortcomings were and how we chose to address those. Then we'll look at 3.0, a new tool experience with some new features. And finally, <clears throat> A look behind the scenes into how our tools, specifically the KSIM tools, work for anybody that may have a question of, well, how did this simulation or this simulation capability come to be? So first, let's set the stage. The history of KSIM, it's a long story. It predates me and my involvement with Kemet by quite a ways. It actually started um, back in 1992 the actual core math and models of it started back in 1992 with uh, one of our um, R&D engineers here at Kemet. And those were actually in Lotus Notes repository. So way, way back then, um, apologies to those of us that are still using Lotus Notes. Hopefully we'll get out of that soon. Um, around 1994, we moved those equations over to Excel and it was a giant Excel file. And then it evolved into MathCAD scripts and in 1998, we introduced um, Kemet Spice. And it took a lot of those same equations that we had before and packaged them up into the Kemet Spice software that some of you might be familiar with. And that's where this all really started to pick up steam. And there were some additions to parts and components for, over the years, but for a long time, it was largely unchanged until 2004, where we moved it to um, what I guess can be considered case in 1.0 in a way. That was our uh, web spice tool. And that, um, that lived somewhat unchanged for a little while until in 2016, we introduced KSIM 2.0. And then um, now we are ready to introduce KSIM 3.0. And I'm sure many of you are here with bated breath going, well, when is this actually launching? I'll get to that toward the end of the session. Actually, in case, before I forget, I'll, I will say that now. We're looking to launch KSIM 3.0 on April 27th this month. So we still have a couple more internal things to check out, but April 27th is our go live date with KSIM 3.0. So briefly, let's just talk about why KSIM, why all these tools, why do we need to do these things? 
So looking at one of Kemet's core competencies, capacitors, um, it's obvious that they're more than just parallel plates that, that we learned in school, just parallel plates separated by a dielectric. Um, there are different types of capacitors and each of them behave differently uh, because they're constructed differently. And that difference and that variation in construction is what results in the different um, lumped circuit element models for each. So um, whereas a tantalum capacitor has an RC ladder type of structure, and that's very much a result of the construction of the capacitor itself, a ceramic capacitor with that layered structure has um, a more sort of traditional looking lumped circuit element model with a bulk capacitance and some parasitics around it to represent the ESR and the ESL and the insulation resistance. And then which one do I choose? There's no such thing as an ideal capacitor. There are some benefits to one that the other doesn't have. Um, for example, you know, ceramic capacitors, they're small, they have a medium-ish sort of cap range, uh, but specifically with class two capacitors, they have that voltage effect where they lose uh, capacitance with applied bias voltage. And that's, that's not a, a question of manufacturer, but rather a question of materials that we all commonly use. And then tantalum capacitors, obviously, they have their benefits in high volumetric efficiency, very, very stable with a wide band of, of low ESR. And ultimately, they are somewhat limited in voltage, especially as you compare them to ceramic capacitors. So it's ultimately the application itself that will be the primary factor that determines which capacitor to use. And knowing which one to use and how it might behave, that's where simulation tools like casing come in. So let's get a little bit into um, KSIM 2.0 and, and seeing where we're coming from. So um, switch over here to our web browser and open up the current instance of KSIM. So this, what's loading on the screen right now, this is KSIM 2.0. And right away, you can tell that there's, um, well, this is the webinar we're all in. Right away, you can tell that there's a bit of work to be done here to get this to be an updated and better user experience. But let's go through it and go through the experience of what it's like to selecting a capacitor. And right away, you're greeted with a big list of options, um, not much direction as to where to go. But even so, once you get through all that, you select your component, and then you get into those details that everybody's really interested in. The impedance and ESR curves, uh, cap and inductance, and we'll go through all these things in the 3.0 instance of casing. So let's get into that. Um, this is casing 3.0, built on brand new or much newer, more modern web technology, um, and frankly, more responsive. Um, the selection here on the side, we, it's now a bit more compact and guided experience where you can go and select your various different options of capacitors and different families, and then selecting the K sizes, dielectrics, and things like that. So let's just select a, for the sake of our argument, a 1206 um, X7R, like a common value here, one microfarad. So right there, um, we have the selection of the capacitor we have without having to go from one screen to another. In the case in 2.0 experience, you had to go from the home screen over to the selection screen and then ultimately to the plot window. With the new tool, you get to the plot window uh, without having to go through multiple steps of, of, uh, of screens and screen refreshes. And the options are still available to you. With this tool, you can explore for the selected capacitor. You can explore the impedance in ESR. You can also apply different conditions to it. So if I wanna see the behavior of this capacitor under, in this case, let's say a uh, 3.3 or a three volt bias condition that, um, 
that applies it right there. Now, in this case, it, it didn't particularly move too much. Uh, but then we can view the capacitance and inductance. So this, uh, this is the capacitance versus frequency for this, for this particular component here. And what's occurring here that may look like a discontinuity or your capacitance is shooting up into infinity. What's actually happening there is that you're approaching the self-resonant point, which is also reflected here in the impedance and ESR point. So impedance as you go up in frequency, impedance and ESR, as you go up in frequency, continue to decrease until you hit that self-resonant point. And at that point, what's going on is that the capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants are resonating with one, another, with one another to cancel out. And the only thing you're left with is the real component, the resistance, in that case, the ESR, the, the lowest point of the ESR. So that's also reflected here when you're looking at capacitance and inductance in that the capacitance value appears to shoot up to infinity and then disappears and then the inductance is picked up. So at that point, after self-resonance, your capacitor is actually behaving more like an inductor. And um, with tools like KSIM, with a tool like KSIM, you can actually see that. The, we can also explore the S11 and S21 uh, parameters that can be then exported using this control here to another tool like ADS or something. Um, in addition to being able to, in addition to being able to explore the S parameters, you can look at the spice models themselves. So in this case, this is the lump circuit element representation for this capacitor. And you can also export this using that same control at the selected uh, center frequency for this particular instance of the lump circuit element model. And those are all table stakes things that we had with casing 2.0. None of that is necessarily new at this point yet. But some of the things that are new that were not previously ported, uh, supported, excuse me, in KSIM 2.0 was the capability to export this as an image. So here we have the ability to download the image of the plot window and view it as um, and be able to view that and share it with, with colleagues. So now we're starting to introduce some more collaborative features that in times like this will become more critical and more important. In addition to that, uh, when you, um, you have the ability to share, to share a simulation. So let's suppose that I'm trying to set up a decoupling network and a decoupling network that consists of, in this case, a one mic, um, let's say uh, a 10 nanofarad capacitor. And again, the simulation shows up on the screen right away without having to go through multiple instances of screen refreshes. And we'll add a, another capacitor to, to our decoupling session, to our decoupling network. In this case, let's say a 470 microfarad tantalum capacitor, tantalum polymer capacitor. So this is the behavior of all three plotted independently. But we also have the capability to combine their impedances. And this solid gray line here is the combined impedance of the decoupling network. So I have, um, let's say I wanna do maybe two in this decoupling network, I can do two of these, of these uh, 10 nanofarad capacitors and that somewhat shifted my response a little bit. And I can do that for the rest as well. I can go and then click this control here and that will copy the current state of the tool to the clipboard. And, um, and you can then share that with a colleague. So then paste it into a new, tab and as the tool refreshes and brings it all back up 
the original instance of the tool is brought back up. So once again, we're introducing features that allow for further collaboration when we all have to sort of work and be working in situations that we're not normally used to. One of the things that we've, we've done is to start to bring together our different tools, um, such as our different tools and our different capabilities. Some of you on the call may be familiar with our, um, our search engine of components, as we call it, um, Component Edge. Component Edge has a great deal of information, especially, especially that parametric type of information. And we've, we have the capability to not only link you from KSIM to something like Component Edge that will bring up some of those parametric part details, but also um, bring that information to KSIM itself right here. So from this dropdown, you can select the spec sheet for the part itself, the data sheet for the entire family itself, download step files, and any of the relevant Rojas documentation as well. So it doesn't end there. For many years, um, KSIM, well, KSIM and Kemet as a whole, really, we were at our core a capacitor company, and we, we still are. But we are now um, expanding our capabilities into, the, into magnetics as well. So we've introduced into KSIM, under the KSIM umbrella of tools, a, some inductor simulation capability. So you can choose the specific family of inductor with the size and then start to be able to simulate and get a sense of the behavior of that inductor. In this case, this is inductance versus current. But you can also have a, get a sense of the power loss or even the temperature rise in something like uh, a buck topology once you plug in some of these operational parameters. We've also introduced some tools to help answer questions like uh, capacitor aging. That's one of the things that commonly comes up is, uh, especially for class two capacitors, is this aging effect. Uh, what happens in class two capacitors is that as the uh, stresses and strains that were built up within the barium titanate dielectric structure uh, start to relax a little bit, that happens over time, naturally, some of that capacitance goes down because the, the strength of the dipoles themselves are somewhat decreasing. So um, with this aging tool, you can get an estimate of how much capacitance you would lose over time. We're also introducing what we call our um, life expectancy model for, uh, for film capacitors. And this is one of the first tools in, uh, in the industry that take into account humidity as part of the life expectancy of film capacitors. So, you can put in multiple mission profiles here with various different conditions and the amount of working time for each, and then be able to get a sense of, okay, under these conditions, under these um, different profiles, how long will my capacitor last? So um, we've also introduced uh, a quick little tool, a way to calculate, you know, if I know how much power dissipation I have, well, how much capacitance do I need? And it tries to give you a sense of the amount of chips on the board and, and things like that. So all of those things are new tools that we introduced via uh, KSIM 3.0. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we will launch this in, um, we will launch this in, uh, on April 27th. Before we adjourn, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for attending this webinar. Um, we'll definitely accelerate or try to, you know, we'll, we'll hit that date of, of launching KSIM 3.0 on April 27th so that you can start taking advantage of some of these collaborative features such as uh, the image export and the, the sharing of, of the links and the instances of the tool because 
we're all in a situation now where we have to adapt the best we can. And one of the things that we as component manufacturers can do is present the industry with the tools necessary for everybody to do their job in whatever circumstances they're in. So um, thank you for attending. Once again, my name is Wilmer Companioni. And if you have any questions beyond this point, please send them to ksim at kemet.com. That'll go to my inbox, I'll see it, and I'll, I'll get to that at that point. So thank you for attending. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. So thank you very much, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank <laughs> you.